raw dog this thing. Helicopter, surely. Yeah. That's good. I like that. I like that. Uh, hello, and welcome to the Obscure Aerospace Files, a podcast about cool things we like that fly. I'm Randy. And I'm Bill. And today we're going to talk about the fairy rotodyne. Uh, Bill, I've got written here, what do you know about this goofy MF? Um, hmm. We're going to find out, aren't we? I'm. I. You know what? To be perfectly honest, I am not sure what I know about it. There are things <laughs> I think I know about it, but... Knowing you, they may turn out to be entirely wrong. So um, it, it is a striking vehicle, isn't it? It's so rotund, which is ironic because I it mean, has a square fuselage. Yeah, yeah, it, it both is and isn't in some ways. You know, big fin, big dolphin-shaped engine pods. Otherwise looks a bit like a loaf. I mean, it's got kind of like a... Lancaster was sort of square too. Lancaster also had a military registration mark on it. As this one does. Does it now? XE521. Well, there's like... Well, there you go. There's chat behind that. I've got I've got gallons of chat about this let's, let's bizarre get, thing. Let's get right into it. But you, but yeah, it's interesting that you say you don't know if you know about it. Because yeah. a lot of the assumptions I'd previously had right. were, were shaken or shook. I don't know what mm. the correct term is uh, by this. Uh, by the way, we put these episodes up on YouTube so you can uh, see some fun visuals while we talk about stuff. This is a novel concept nobody else has done before for an engineering podcast, I think. Consider throwing it up on your second screen while you click on things on your first screen. If you have it to tab away from time to time, we understand. Now listen closely, 007. This is an auto gyro. Do, do try and bring it back in one piece, Dublin. Don't do any really cool chase really, scenes with it. Okay. It really is Sean Connery, huh? It really... That's why they've got all the cardboard tubes strapped to the bottom sides and wherever else. If I recall correctly, the most problematic thing from You Only Live Twice was that they posited <laughs> an auto gyro could beat a helicopter in pitched battle. Right. All and right. that was, that was the that only was problematic that was thing from that film. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I've put in a helpful diagram here just to set the scene a little bit. Yeah. Which is that when you're reading about these things, people get kind of confused as to like what this auto gyro thing is that we're looking at here versus a helicopter. And then you've got weird things like tilt rotors. Like That's the, like the, an Osprey. Like an Osprey. Gotcha. Now, all of these things are rotor craft. What? But just, just to help you set the scene initially, don't get too confused. What we're talking about aren't helicopters. Yep. They're not weird, silly tilt rotors. Everything here, except for the thing we're talking about, exists inside the definition of autogyro. We are going to introduce more names for different forms of these things to really confuse oh, people. Oh, right? it's going to be it's going to be great. Great. Okay. Yeah. Good. An airplane works by the thrust of the engine moving the vehicle forward, which causes air to flow over its lifting surfaces. Be that wings, lifting body, whatever, ever other exotic things you like. Um, because of the shape of those surfaces, it generates circulation, it generates pressure differentials, and that causes lift to happen. It also generates drag, both from the fact that you're trying to push something through the air, but there is also lift-induced drag caused by those lifting surfaces. And I think we need to be really clear on the point that it is not drag on the freely spinning helicopter blade looking things that is causing them to spin. It is in fact their own lift. So the, if, you, if you imagine a wing, the lift force points up. Now, if you were to tilt the wing forward a little bit, the lift force would now point up and forwards a little bit. And it's that forwards component that is causing the blades to spin. It's basically a wing, but it is also the, the, the speed of the air flowing over this wing is different from the vehicle speed because it is spinning. That is unlike how an airplane works with fixed wings because the vehicle speed, the vehicle airspeed is the airspeed over the wings, more or less. The thrust is being provided in the normal way, unlike a helicopter where, you know, if your lift vector is pointing up and forwards a little bit as we've described, but that is now a powered rotor, you can point it forwards to the point where you actually pull the entire vehicle along with the lift generated by the blades. The first pioneer of this is, is the gentleman you can see right hand side upper guy and his motivation in pioneering this form of, of aircraft was that they can be quite easy customers in some ways because your stall speed and your takeoff speeds are far lower 
Right. They can take Fine. off and land yes. on shorter runways sure. when it's still the twenties and you don't have built out the earliest stovals. The earliest stovals. That you think about this as a precursor to the F thirty five in the sense that it's nothing like it. And <laughs> back in this era of the twenties, you just had like very few runways. You were taking off and landing on fields or on like public roads. If you had a vehicle that was pretty happy to take off and land at very slow speeds, right? That's actually a huge advantage. Yep, yep. Sometimes, I guess, especially given that a lot of aerodromes, as they were called at the time, are grass fields. Not having to go super fast on them would be would be helpful, huh? I really wish we yep. still called them aerodromes. It's better. There's a reason why these aren't flown very often anymore. Mm. So one such thing is a uh, power pushover or bunt over, right? Which is when if you just uh, take the propeller that Sean Connery is standing behind there, like really helpfully obscuring with his nice crisp white shirt. I know, yeah. I know, yeah, I know. Again, one of the few crimes of this film. Um, so you can't <laughs> see the propeller. Uh, if you drew a line forwards from from the hub of that propeller through the aircraft, uh, that's your thrust line. This line of thrust that you can draw from your propeller hub forwards is too far above your center of gravity, i.e. the central point where all the weight could be assumed to act through of the vehicle. Mm. They love tipping over. In terms of having your, your center of thrust be above your center of gravity, mm -hmm. you know, why is this not an issue for airplanes <laughs> with high mounted engines? Like all the seaplanes with giant, like in Porco Rosso, right? Where the thing is a meter above the fuel tank or whatever else. Part of the problem is autogyros don't scale to the size of large seaplanes, mm. where these differences become far more pronounced. Right. So when that thrust line yeah. is really far above your center of gravity line, do, do they not? Do they just not scale? They we, get too big. Well, I will get onto that, won't we? Oh, yeah, yes, I think we, we will. will. Yes. Oh, the, I'm connecting the dots as we speak, folks. It's going to be a wild ride. There's no tail rotor. No, unlike a helicopter, yeah. this does not need a tail to counteract the torque generated by the rotor. Early Sierra C4s, you can see in the top right. Yeah. Those were the, the first ones of these that worked, uh, in short, because Juan de Sierra, being an aristocratic Spanish man, went to the opera and figured out how to get rid of the, the, the rotor instability he was suffering and put them at on the, hinges. Sorry, at the opera? We'll get into the ups and downs, literally, of, of this technology. Speed ratio wave drag. <laughs> Ups and downs, it's good. Um, so, so Juan, our boy Juan, he's not our boy. He's not our boy. He recognizes the need for aircraft that can fly safely at slower speeds. For the aforementioned, not great infrastructure on the ground. Conventional aircraft at the time are not the safest, nor most stable way of flying. But you also don't have many other options. What about the airship? Well... That's the thing, right? You've got biplanes of various sizes, which you need to go fairly quick to stay flying and are therefore great at crashing into things. Or you've got dirigibles like airships, which are ironically not very good at staying aloft and are even better at crashing into things. <laughs> Don't worry, we'll get to those guys. I did a first year project on the R101 disaster. Yeah. We are getting the binders out. But what if you had a little spinning guy that doesn't need to fly fast at all and can safely auto-rotate down to the ground on the rotor if something goes wrong? Well, like all great inventions, which this wasn't, Sierra had a few misfires in the early C1, C2, and C3 series. And uh, the challenge here was handling the dissymmetry of lift. Yeah. Which just to hit You're gonna, you, yeah. to hit you people over the head. This will be good. With an explanation of th these aerodynamics. Disymmetry. Disymmetry. Uh -huh. Dissymmetry. Oh, dissymmetry. Yes. Lift unsymmetric. So to, I'll try and explain ah, it. Because you have a retreating and advancing side of the blade like a helicopter do. Exactly. But you have no control if you're looking, like a helicopter do. Exactly. So right. if you're looking down at a helicopter. Yep. From the top. Bird's from eye. From the top. Yep. Bird's eye. And one of its blades, rotor blades, is going from the six o'clock position as if it was a clock face. And the rotor is spinning from the six o'clock position up to the 12 o'clock position. Yep. Right? So the blade, the rotor blade, is going towards the direction you're traveling yeah, so in at, general. At the nine o'clock position, you're adding the velocities, the tangential velocity of the spinning blade yes. and the forward motion of the vehicle. Yes. More speed. Yes. More lift. Yes. Goes with speed. Then squared. you go past the 12 o'clock. Right. Uh oh. And now your blade's traveling with the direction against, against the. 
It's going the wrong way. It's going backwards. It's going backwards. As it passes three o'clock, we subtract the vehicle's forward motion from the velocity of the air that the blade sees. And, and you're having these cyclical, constant little variations and, in velocity. And that's, that giving, you, that's giving you a roll yes, moment. Yes. Because right? so on, you just tilt the, the, the fucking tailplane the other way, right? That's how we fix all. On no, what happens is you go to the opera because you're a Spanish aristocrat. Oh. And you figure out that if your small bamboo models, their rotors were able to flex loads that offset this disymmetry of lift effects that causes instability. So what if you just put hinges on your rotor? Oh no. Oh yes. Oh, no. oh yes. Wait, so when so when you have more lift on the advancing side, it flexes it up, which essentially I'm not entirely <laughs> sure how that would work, but okay. Plane when the, when the thing goes up, <laughs> the angle of attack is decreasing, which would then decrease. Mm. So so this brigadier general James G Weir of the Glasgow Pumps and Shipbuilding Dynasty, but also that's of the Royal very, Air Force. That's yeah, very good. He's the man with the short tie and pipe there. He's the man with the short tie and pipe. Great. We are ended up commissioned in the Royal Flying Corps by way of the artillery. And oh, by, right. Yep. Cool. And by 25, he had formed... He's the, the guy, huh? He's, 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 a, he's a guy. Yeah. And he's, gonna, he's the guy for auto gyros because he, by 25... He's got the company going, the Sierra Auto Gyro Company, which is incorporated in... Oh, it's the next slide. It's it's the United oh. Kingdom. I don't know much about this place, but I did some research. He first, So the, the, the Sierra C4, the one that actually worked because he went to the opera, it first flew for the Spanish military in 23. And and they were quite impressed. But really, it was in it was in Britain where unsurprisingly, this very silly, eccentric, but also cheap to execute mm -hmm. idea truly, and sometimes even literally took off. <laughs> I really do like the British old school aviation colors. Like I, I genuinely really like them. So the Sierra Auto Gyro Company proliferated this design. This one that you see here is very similar to the one in the far top right of the last slide. The C4 was licensed built by Pitt Cairn in the US. And by Focke Wolf in Germany. This guy, big guy in the camouflage on the left hand side is, which is not actually that big, it's actually quite small, because they were all small, because you can't scale an auto gyro, uh, was the C30 Avro Rota. As, in case it's not obvious, these were not very good. Uh, they, so the perform, not only do they not scale well and they can't carry very much, they really don't perform well as aircraft. Be like Justin Timberlake and tell me why. Ain't nothing but a heartbreak. How, how is this relevant to auto gyros? You didn't have to actually sing. Tell me why they, Ain't they were Ain't nothing shit. but a mistake. Yeah, they were a mistake. Yeah. You're about to go into World War II with something that can't fly fast, can't carry very much. But you don't know what World War II is or is going to be. But you do because... I mean, you're looking... The Germans are spending all their money on, you know, flammable zeppelins. Wrong war. Huh? That was the other war. Hindenburg crash when? Well, they weren't using those for warfare. They were using the secret... They would have they were using... if they hadn't been so flammable. No, they were making the secret BIFTA 109. They were making under a big tarp that said, it doesn't <laughs> contain... Not in violation of any treaties, <laughs> we swear. Look at these sh cool ships instead. League of Nations. Buffet this way! And then a big arrow. <laughs> Is this the point where they finally went extinct? Are they, are they done now? Oh, oh, well. So the... the, 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 the because basically all you've told me so far is... Um, a Spanish guy went to the opera and invented them, and then they were shit, except maybe safer than the other flying vehicles at that particular moment in some circumstances. I'd argue that even by the 30s, they were they were redundant. Right. Uh, and by 1936, Juan de Sierra was redundant because uh, he passed away. Um, and <laughs> Gatwick? Gatwick? Yep. Um, and uh, that, that was a true story you told me about? Yet the true story I told you that I will probably cut from this because I got a bit too real in it was that Juan de Sierra, after being a um, bad people collaborator, <laughs> was involved in an air crash. The tragedy for the other passengers on board had a second silver lining. The auto gyro would just be another footnote in the history books if it weren't for what came afterwards, and therefore the topic of this podded cast. One of the only good workable <laughs> thing to come from the entire godforsaken auto gyro project, yeah. which you are now thoroughly aware of yeah. as an audience if you're still here, is that Dr. J. Bennett became chief engineer. 
he will return of? the Sierra Autogyro company. Aha. Uh-huh. So they'll Which keep Which is a Spanish but British. Right. Mainly British mainly with a Spanish British. guy now dead haha in it. <laughs> gotcha. Right? Yeah, through, throughout the 30s, they kept hammering out even more CL, Sierra type auto gyros. They also had a few of the Weir. They named it after the other guy. Yeah, yeah. Which were like more engorged. Sure, he And had more that. modern engines. Yeah, he did. The company pivoted towards like the helicoptery market after the war. They made the, the world's largest helicopter after the war for a time, the Tri Rotor W11 Air Horse, which we'll see in a second. Can we see it now? Well, unfortunately, we have to consult this episode's timeline. Oh, sorry. Next slide, please. Right. Welcome to the British aircraft manufacturing industry. Circa, ah, yeah. Yes, until 1977. So, folks, your reward for making it through this slide and this part of the presentation is you get to see the, what was it? Tri-rotor. Air horse. Air horse. I, I there will... is an air horse waiting for you Some. It better be in the. It's in the slide deck. It's in the. It's in the slide deck. There's an air horse waiting for you in the slide deck. A tri rotor air horse. You do have to look at this. Uh, this like family tree of British aerospace companies. Yeah, I, I think it's just important to remember that this is a non-exhaustive list. The sector was identified as a crucial one by the government, and, and there's a stereotype out there that, that, that it's just all these companies were just guys in sheds with funny names just having a go at things to see what the deal with aircraft was that is what i think about that is aircraft. exactly what it was and we will see more of this later <laughs> on funding from the government helps you just have a dozen different companies at once that are just trying to do their own thing and experiment and a lot of them fail and they still keep going and and as time went by and we slowly figured out what the deal with plane was they would start to go into their own niches in the british and international export landscapes okay this is good when the industry is still fairly new and you're still experimenting with things we don't know what shit yet so mm. you can convince anyone that it might be good what if you start discovering what that is ah oh, but you do it anyway and then that's why you see the lines begin to converge here mm. is because all these companies end up spending years spinning their wheels not doing great on the sales pitch and not engaging fantastically with markets some of the stuff it's absolutely cracking. Some of it, really not. Good. All right, there were companies and there weren't. However, one of the companies was, press the arrow, but then don't advance the slide. Yes. Ah. Ah. The Ferry Aviation Company. I can't go. It kept going for quite a long time. I know. I didn't make the slide deck very well. The Ferry Aviation Company was founded in 1915 by a guy surprisingly called Richard Ferry and a Belgian dude surprisingly called Ernest Oscar Tips. They left the shorts company. Ah. The... Aircraft manufacturer, not the clothing. With you? Yep. They cut out their niche in this bizarre British ecosystem as your go-to for not naval... The, not the bottoms of their trousers. A little short joke for you. Sorry. You're going to have to take that one again. Nah, I'm, nah, I'm leaving it in. We're, we're cracking up. So they, 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 they cut their niche. Do you think we should be not as self-aware of our own editing? No, I think it's funny. Okay, I think it's great. Earnest. Yeah, all right. Good, yeah. then that, this bit's staying in. Remember Wonderful. that bit where I was really in I think that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think it's fine as well. Ferry cut out their niche uh, in the in this bizarre British ecosystem of, of your go-to for naval and carrier-based aircraft, except you, oh, could, cool. also, well, you could also go so, to Hawker or Supermarine for those as well. Yeah, oh, right. The, the Ferry made the Swordfish, the Fomar, the Albacore, the Barracuda. I stopped knowing what all of these were. The Firefly? Mm-hmm. Yep. The Spearfish? Uh, better. Yeah, a lot of, not good, seaplanes, good. but like a lot of carrier-based things. No, oh, fine. So yeah. they were used a lot by the Fleet Air Arm. For non-Brit bongers, the Fleet Air Arm is the Navy, the Royal Navy's Air Force. Naval Aviation. A bit like how, yeah, exactly. A, how, bit, a bit like how the US Navy has the second largest Air Force. Are you reading my script? of aircraft. Do you want to see an Air Horse? Yeah, fuck yeah, 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 yeah. Press the next slide. So with a set... Woo! Air horse. Is oh your, my god! Is it's, your, um, it's even better than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> it's like the worst possible outcome of the Chinook pitch meeting. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, those are all. Um, all the things I'm looking at are very good. The, the Second World War. It's coming to a close. The world of aerospace. It's fundamentally changed, folks. The world of aerospace has fundamentally changed. Everyone knows it. They don't want me to say it, but I'm going to say it. The world of aerospace has fundamentally changed. Does that one land on the truck? Oh, yeah. It had to take off from the truck. Well, it would, it would at Farnborough, it would land on the truck as a joke. <laughs> uh, There's really fun footage of it zipping around Farnborough. 
because it's just so nimble because it has this jet engine just just galloping at this rotor and it was so maneuverable uh but weirdly enough the meme jet copter didn't find any customers <laughs> in, the, in the armed forces. Uh, the, there's like a running theme with ferry, right? So if you look them up on Wikipedia, there are three main projects people have listed for them. Are a, one of the aforementioned engorged biplanes they made for the Navy, fair, an experimental Delta Wing aircraft that was the first plane to fly at a thousand miles an hour, and a medium what? girder bridge, which was a bridge. <laughs> So this is this 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 is all part of the ferry aviation mythos. Yeah. After the war, our boy Richard Ferry was looking for new business opportunities. A lot of engineers from the Sierra Auto Gyro Company found their way into ferry, and they were already pitching to the British government. This guy, Dr. J. Bennett, for, chief engineer at the Sierra Auto Gyro Company, was approaching the Air Ministry and the Ministry of Supply. This would be a totally new kind of aircraft because it would be capable of vertical takeoff and landing but also conventional flight. Okay. Thankfully, the, the market hadn't matured yet to recognize if this was a good idea or not, and the British government was very keen to keep the whole innovating aircraft thing going. Like all good chief engineers, Jay Bennett was able to play the political game well, and he started cooking up what these bold new aircraft were to become with the Ministry of Supply, which... I don't, I don't know how to describe the Ministry of Supply. I... Trans- That's what it says on the tin. Well, no, but it's like Ministry of just supplying, again, just comically large checkbooks that say, <laughs> please build us an aircraft signed to government. What you're seeing there on the, on the right-hand side on the top row, yep. and then you've got the, cut, the cross section on the left there. Love the eagle cutaway. That is the, the, the Ferry FB1. Mm. Now, what that had was an Alvis Leonidas radial piston engine that powered both the propeller on top and the rotor on top and one wingtip propeller. You haven't shown the left side of the vehicle on purpose. Uh, because there's no wing. No, no. And that starboard prop also counteracted torque. Yeah, it did. So this one wasn't crooked in the ass, but just was missing an arm. And that, that big uh, the circle in the, in the very middle of the aircraft, that's the radial piston That's engine. the big Leonidas there. And then about- presumably a ridiculous gearbox. Oh, let me tell you about the. Let me I'm tell glad you, you have something about, about the FP1. Yeah, yeah, yeah. uh, so that had approximately 540 horsepower on tap, uh, and that was communicating. Is it? Communicating. a big vehicle. It was supercharged as well, I think. Yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. And it had, and, it, and then it would communicate these various RPMs and torques yep. between the engine itself, the rotor, and the propeller, because obviously they have to spin at different rates. They're different sized blades. They need different loading to, to work as a. Oh plane. no! So you need a lot of, of gearboxes, all right? So this allowed the FB1 to hover like a helicopter, but also fly like a quote-unquote real plane. And it gave the prototype favorable performance characteristics when compared to the license-built helicopters that we were making of the American ones or the other ones that Britain was was, was considering was, for was, use. Was the, the top rotor always powered or was that optional? That top rotor yeah. would be unpowered in cruise. Yeah, yeah. Would, so you had some Still cl- a, a clutch that would, or something that, yes. would, that would disconnect it from the drive. But the important thing is that would still, still auto spin. rotate, yeah, 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 still yeah. spin, still generate lift instead of a wing, unless you had to have uh, one engine. Okay, away. so you can optionally turn it into basically a helicopter. Yes. And then what if a helicopter could transition into a plane and then? Back? Oh, it, yeah, and it's really easy to transition from vertical to horizontal flight, as we know. This transition was a really big part of these early prototypes where they had to figure out first how to fly it controlled like a helicopter, and then, yeah, make that transition. So it was first flown uh, in 40, 48. Mm. Uh, so Basil Arkell did a short course around White Waltham, which is an airfield in, I great, believe, great, near, nor- north name. of London. Where they did all this rotodyne stuff happened there. And so they broke world rotorcraft speed records. Oh, shit. Fairly low flights around 10,000 feet, but they did quite a lot of them over 15 months. And they were going to attempt another world record run um, until the rotor failed during flight on April 17th, 49. The FB1 plunges into the, Bar- the Berkshire countryside. The point, unfortunately, this, this killed the pilot, uh, F.H. Dixon, and the flight test observer, Derek Garraway. Investigation revealed poor machining quality on the rotor head led to fatigue failure. So in response to this, Ferry created a completely separate rotorcraft division to ensure high levels of quality and 
now, governance were upheld. Okay, it must have just fallen off or something, because I thought the, the whole point was they were going to auto-rotate down to the ground in a real safe control. No, as in the, the, the rotor head itself, like, f mechanically failed and yeah. broke and flat. Great. So naturally, these eccentric, eccentric people were completely <laughs> undeterred by the FB1 <laughs> crash, but then they would spend the next five years refining the a replacement. so big. <laughs> They're so big in this picture. Okay. Yep. Randy. Yeah. This one has two propellers, but they point in opposite ah, directions. What you're seeing here is the jet gyrodyne. This is the replacement for the... <laughs> That's the FB1. This is the jet you know, gyrodyne. Wow, do I wish for a picture of the other side of the FB1, but okay. Oh, no. So the My jet... My brain won't it's just imagine it without the... It's just smooth. <laughs> like a Ken doll. Okay. Well, we first need to discuss how half of the FB1's dry weight was propulsive. Because that Alvis <laughs> engine... <laughs> Good. Yeah. The, the Alvis engine with his main gearbox with first stage reduction with that clutch and freewheel, yeah. then an upper gearbox with double <laughs> epicyclic reduction gear and a rotor brake, then a gearbox in the starboard wingtip, because there's only one of them, with its own reduction gear <laughs> and propeller pitch mechanism. Yeah. This is just too, too many mechanical <laughs> linkages. Too many in the FB1. So, so what would you? As a, you're an engineer, what would what would you do in this situation if you, if you wanted to make the next prototype uh, aircraft that would improve this? Make the engine run slower, fewer gearboxes, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I noticed your well, I, the answer wouldn't now. It wouldn't happen to be put in a jet engine that runs at even higher RPMs, <laughs> like thirty to forty thousand, maybe. What if you? Pulled air in from two compressors in the fuselage and then directed that into tips on the rotor blades to ignite kerosene to generate thrust, thus spinning the rotor. It's effectively like a jet compressor into the, fus into the fuselage to then get this air mixed with kerosene to the tips of the rotors uh -huh. and then detonate the kerosene on the tips of the rotors. I see, I see. It's just, it's a jet engine deconstructed. Yes. So instead of running... No bun. And you're also driving two push prop wingtip propellers. If, what, oh, but the, it's, it's it's like the fan in the turbo fan is is run really indirectly off a different compressor from a different engine. There is no turbine because that's for nerds. To be clear, folks, what we're doing is I, we are <laughs> pumping fuel rich air to the tips of these massive rotor blades yeah. and then igniting the fuel in there out of little rocket jet things on the tips of the rotors. This is how, instead of a nerd helicopter that uses an engine, loser, to make its rotor spin, this uses explosions. Let me just read to you a quote here. The really difficult operation was the transition back to helicopter flight. <laughs> a great deal of flying was required before the best propeller pitch and tip jet relighting sequence could be established. <laughs> A major part of the difficulty was that, with the compressors being driven, there was no reserve of engine power for the propellers during the relighting sequence, and the aircraft descended rapidly no. okay, in no, auto-rotation okay, <laughs> until the jets had been relit. Listen, no, no, no. It's not, it's not quite as stupid. The, it's like if you described the bits of a jet engine of, a tur of like the highest bypass ratio turbofan imaginable. No, it's like a- You need to you stop analogizing this as a normal engine. I like it a lot though, because it's like if you gave someone all of the kind of labeled black box <laughs> items of a turbofan diagram, but didn't tell them where they go. And so they took the fan and put it on top. And then they put the combustion cans on the ends of the fan blades. And then they they couldn't figure out what to do with the turbine. So, I don't know, they turned it into propellers and put it outside. Now, they didn't know how it ran, so they just... Well, look, it's, it's fucking... I, I appreciate... My mic's falling off in all that excitement. <laughs> I appreciate your, your confusion, your shock. But just, uh, this will reassure you. So long as the relighting was being done over or near an aerodrome, there was no particular danger in this situation. That's where we fly all the time. I couldn't exactly well, Yes. <laughs> over and near... <laughs> a controlled landing could be made and often was made in auto rotation often's doing a lot of heavy a lot lifting of heavy there. yeah well the, the, the jet gyrodyne isn't uh, as, the final, as has finally established the drill was to throttle back momentarily engage the compressor clutch switch on the tip jet ignition and fuel supply and progressively fine off the propeller pitch 
This automatically opened the intake valves to the compressors. The tip jets relit when a certain head pressure had been reached, yep. and the collective pitch was increased to keep the rotor speed down. Propeller pitch was then slowly reduced to zero so that maximum power was available for the blowers to give full tip jet thrust. Holy shit. They made 180 transitions and 140 auto rotative landings. <laughs> Don't worry though. Everything they did with this jet gyrodyne was that's in service a, of making a solid it solid majority. I mean, it's, if it works for electing government leaders, it'll work for uh, jet gyrodynes. Yeah, yeah, clearly because they they always knew they wanted to build the thing on the bottom right. For all of its oddities and failures, Ferry and Doctor Bennett was cooking. And what were they cooking? They were cooking the rotodyne, the rotisserie aerodyne. No, that's not really his name. <laughs> The, the, the jet gyrodyne you're seeing here flew until 53-ish, right? Okay, well, sometimes, and sometimes it auto-rotated. I just want 55. It's still 55. The, it auto-rotated down to the aerodrome. But it was like all the way through from like the late 40s, Dr. Bennett was like, look, this concept is solid. We're going to have airliners. We're going to have military transports. You need to give us these specifications. Like, we've got the plan here to make this bold new kind of aircraft. So it's been some years. This is all... The Ministry of Supply checkbooking yes. in action. Oh, yeah. They've sold none. nothing. Right, good. What you see in the bottom right is so the still the a mock up. Right. Right? So Dr. Bennett isn't out of touch. It's the market that is wrong. Well, let's be honest. We're not operating the market. We're no. operating for the Ministry of Supply. I'm with you. Uh, British European airlines are also quite interested in this. So between 49 and 53, Various proposals for such an aircraft were made by the company, and this involved, in turn, a lot of negotiations with engine manufacturers, because, don't worry, if you thought we had too many aircraft manufacturers, this tiny, tiny island also has quite a lot of engine manufacturers. They were also involved... And they were going door to door to these different companies like Napier and Son, Rolls Royce, Armstrong, Sidley, figuring out like for their big, even bigger, even stupider Rotodyne, what engine combination of compressors and stuff they were going to use from which company. Total war economy is a hell of a drug. Huh? Total war economy in 1953. Let's just be <laughs> clear about this. In the end, Napier was selected with two of their Aland. NLA, three turboshaft engines being used on the Rotodyne Y prototype. Kind of begs the question, doesn't it? So so in April of 53, the Ministry of Supply once again reached for their comically large checkbook and awarded them specification RH142D. Yep. For dick around. <laughs> we gotta just quickly ask... You've, nah, you've put trains in yeah. here. Yeah, this was all a ploy. I know. And uh, the rest of the episode is going to be about the LMS Jubilee class seen here on the top <laughs> left. But we, we have to ask, like, like, why do we want this? Why do we want this airplane for carrying people and cargo that can take off like a helicopter and fly like a plane? Because today we have planes that are more than capable of carrying way more people than these things ever could. Far longer distances, more economically. Well, there was, I mean, there was this interesting thing happening in the 50s. I, I know there was a similar um, sort of dynamic when it came to, maybe this is a bit earlier, but uh, but seaplanes. Everyone thought that the, in, the infrastructure expense to set up large paved runways to carry the kinds of sizes of vehicles that would make air travel economical would be you know, prohibitive. No one, no one would be willing to invest that much into building that much, uh, that much infrastructure. And so they were looking for ways to get around it. And one way was, well, water's a runway when it's calm. Um, and the other way, presumably, was to have something that had, I, I would imagine, better fuel efficiency at cruising speeds than a helicopter. No, maybe. Um, and also could take off and land from a, a small, smaller circle of pavement. But then what happened is they spent the entire war building airstrips everywhere. And eventually the various air forces said, I don't need quite this many of them. Thank you. You're welcome to buy them up and turn them into airports. So this is funny because it's a similar conundrum. Airfields existed. We are already post-war. Yeah. You know, like seaplanes are already on the out at this point very much. So it's like the mid 50s we're talking. Yeah, I think and, I was thinking of earlier. Yeah. But sure, but it's a similar thing where people are have this new question, which is how do we conveniently get city to city? Mm. We have regional air travel. We even have helicopters, helicopter airlines. Not only though, are they prohibitively expensive to operate. For, for regular folk? 
No, God, no, don't oh, even, right. none of this sorry, is for sorry, regular sorry. folk. Let's not be silly here. But, you know, regional air flight and even heliports. But they're not sort of private. They're kind of like chartered. You could buy a ticket on one? Oh, no, there were there were like mainline helicopter airlines. Right. In the same way, there were regional airlines. But the point is, even flying didn't give you the same point, like city center to city center travel experience ah. that you could get from just off the top of my head. The train. The uh, 45596 five, Bahamas of the Jubilee class. Um, however, as absolutely just, just great, uh, all these old trains were, they'd also be, at the time, pretty miserable to depend upon for your transport day to day. There's a lot of a lot of things have gotten a lot better in trains, even like compared to what's what used to be luxury. Like it wasn't very pleasant in a travel experience mm. at the time. Hate to say it, because the posters make it all look great. But outside of trains, even if you had a car, you know, you're in the wealth bracket that might fly on a rotodyne or a, even a helicopter airline. Like what you see on the right here is the the, the motorway highway map of Europe at the time. So you just beat the mercy of, of, you know, insane A roads or even worse than that at the time. So th- there was this gap in the, in, the, in the global transport market for convenient, fast, point-to-point intercity travel. Uh, and what would actually happen is the, the, the Japanese were going to meet that in 1964 by inventing the Shinkansen. Mm. But before that happens, the Angloids were going to take a shot at it with their bizarre rotodyne. Yeah. Their plan was simple in the sense that it was complicated. Yeah. The Rotodyne was able to take off and land nearly anywhere. Asterix? Their plan was to have no asterisks in that sentence uh-huh. and just launch from like city center to city center. Quite quite loud, I imagine, the uh, tube jets. Oh, would you imagine that? I, well, I think we Oh, would you imagine that, that? I think we, I think I might have uh, You don't think this is going to be say taking off the top like the the Empire State Heliport anytime soon. Can you not see that happening? Because they were trying that with helicopters already. You can build it on top of the existing mooring mast, right? Over the airships? Yeah, yeah, you just put a platform up there. That could be... Yeah, just put a platform in the Empire State Building. Like at the very top. Yeah. It's about as realistic as using these in any other city, to be honest. Then everyone has to take the elevators up and down to get well, out. People were getting on board with this. But, but Westland Helicopters, who would later actually acquire Ferry, among other helicopter companies, and these big mergers that happened, they built their own heliport in Battersea. All right. To prove that, you know, intercity air travel, they thought sort of was suspended helicopters. on the tops of the... Uh... Of the power plant towers? Or? Beside it. Like in the industrial nightmare Neat. beside it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that the Rosewoodine was therefore able to distinguish itself in two ways. First, demonstrate how intercity point-to-point air travel was possible without the cost or safety risk of helicopters and at scale. The second was demonstrating heavy lift capabilities for the military. Not only is it in a technical sense supposed to provide a totally new field of aircraft design for widespread adoption, it's supposed to be the heralds of a new business model for air transport and integrate into the environments of Europe that yeah. have stood, despite recent efforts at the time, for millennia. What could possibly go wrong? They decided to fulfill the British civil airworthiness requirements for both helicopters and a fixed-wing aircraft, and then they filled, as as the engineers said, they filled in the gaps to interpret what future rotodynes would need in terms of safety requirements. I'm, I'm amazed that was actually possible to, to do both at once. You would think there would be some glide ratio thing that... Uh... They, they, oh, the wings are pretty big. Oh, yikes. <laughs> so okay. the wings you see here, yeah. they look stubby for a normal aircraft. Yeah. Those are full length. They're pretty. Full, full span, sorry, for the, the Pretty big for a helicopter, though, huh? <sighs> but it's also a plane. It's not a helicopter. Yeah. yeah. Is it a plane? Well, don't make don't make me tap the massive Holy Trinity diagram from the yeah, first Yeah, but slide. like, if I, if I put a locking pin in the rotor, could it kind of fly... Or no. What do you... Like I do, because when you say that we're going to meet the airworthiness requirements of an aircraft and a, a rotorcraft, it, it does make me imagine that it should be able to fly in both modes of flight independently for... Aha. Right. Well, it did. Okay. Because that's going back to the whole point of this, which is... Gyro. Yes. Auto rotation. Y- yes. Yeah. So in, again, it uses the compressors and the tip jets to spin the rotor for VTOL. And then flies like a conventional, cruises like a conventional aircraft with Are those the rotor. Turbo props, or we're gonna get to how many turbo shaft engines. engines. Turbo shafts. 
which would drive the rotor? Would, ooh, they would drive the rotor sometimes. Yeah. Same concept. Yeah. And sometimes you would tap off from the compressor of the turbine engine to power the tips. Yes. While the turbine engine was also powering the propellers to go forwards? You would take off vertically, fly straight, transition and fly straight. You know? Yeah, yeah, but like we have shaft power and then we have comp compressed air power, I yeah, guess. Yeah, so you're switching between the two again. Right, but while you're running on compressed air ah, no, I see. Yeah, 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 no, I see. Yes. So you never, you never run, you never run the, the top prop on shaft power. It's either compressor yeah. or nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gotcha, yeah. I'm with you. Um, so, so White Waltham again comes back. It's where they're cooking the rotodyne stuff through the 50s. They've got multiple test, st test stands. Weirdly enough, these were really loud. So they, they kept them really far away. Uh, and so Dave Gibbings it talks about having like two tip jet chambers uh -huh. and then like a fully rotating rig to play with. Okay. And then he made another one of these rotating tip jet rigs in Boscombe Down as well for like developing pilot familiarization and system control systems. Sure. And stuff. But this Dave Gibbings guy, I need to shout him out. He's a bit of a legend in British rotorcraft development. He had a very interesting career. So he went from like an RAF apprentice after the war to the chief flight test engineer at Westland in the 90s and he was involved in pretty much everything westland made after he got merged into them from ferry mm. um so he, yeah so he was the authority on all things rotodyna he uh passed away in in 2022 so i hate to ask again i am thinking about all the rigs and the prototypes and has this company sold things nothing has been sold real customers nothing has been sold Okay. British European airlines say they're very interested. Hachi machi. They went for an all steel rotor blade. <laughs> Fuck. 27.3 meter rotor diameter. Which was yeah. way over the mass budget they expected. You think? The fuselage was built at Hayes and then assembled with engines, rotors, and rear empennage in Stockport. Mm. So the rotodyne was technically a northerner. Mm. A champion, that is. As you can imagine. Feeding a fuel air mix through a rotor hub was a fairly significant engineering challenge. Hence the importance of the jet gyrodyne for demonstrating and exploring these technologies. Yeah, because one part spins and the other sort of doesn't, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So each tip jet, each compressor would feed an opposing set of tip jets. So if one compressor failed... Ah, neat. Smart. Two, yeah, 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 it's yeah. redundant. Right. The tip jets themselves were made out of nickel alloys. The combustion chambers made out of mnemonic 80 and the liners out of mnemonic 75. Cool. Um, and yeah, then once out of VTOL mode, once we're done using the tip jets, we're in cruise flight. We let the, the, the rotor auto rotate, the Alans take over, it flies straight forward. Did they ever have the combustion go kind of back up through the blades and just explode the whole thing? No, never. Oh, they probably routed them separately, huh? Mixed, mix, mix. No, 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 no. That fuel air mix was present all the way from like near the compressors, I think in like the wing route, all the way up through the. They, they sort oh yeah of, they the fuel air mix the fuel early quite early on yeah it didn't explode ever nah they had all these test stands they, they let the engineers figure it out all right our boy dave had this down man um, i mean it it is genuinely very impressive so the, the number of enormous structures meant that a lot of work had to go into studying its acoustics when you've got 6,000 horsepower driving two propellers and a rotor roughly the size of Maidenhead, <laughs> flying at a couple of hundred knots full of British people, you're going to get a lot of vibration. And some of that vibration might even be in resonance with something or someone in this oh, case. Man. So they, they, had to study, they had to study this thing a lot on the ground and they just set it to different prop and rotor speeds to study the effect everything had on each other uh, to just mitigate the risks. So uh, the, the, the Gyrodyne's rotors and landing gear were basically elastic entities. They could bounce with one another to offset the aircraft's mass of like axis of rotation. Yeah. They had to take off the retracting undercarriage <laughs> <laughs> until the air show in 58 to redesign it with dampeners. They also put dampeners in the rotor head. Yeah, and you would have to. Oh, Christ. This is our boy. He's in Farnborough in September 15th. He made it. And he flew, and he and the the the, the dampened retracting undergear worked. Man, so it actually for it actually first flew in November the year before. I mean, it's one of so so, it's one of these things where, as an engineer, 
I find all of the solutions to all of the challenges that they faced putting this thing together. Very interesting, and it's remarkable that at the time, with the technology that they had available, that they managed to make all of this work, that the combustion was stable, that they, you know, they didn't have runaway combustion up through the, the rotor blades, that they managed to balance the power draw from all three semi-propulsive slash lifting surfaces, all the vehicle dynamics, you know, it doesn't fly like anything else, I assume, right? Nope. It's completely bonkers. You trained all the pilots, did all this shit. And for a concept that I think we've established is bad. It is bad, right? They did all of this work to build... Right, right, right. I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off here, right? Okay. Okay. You're going to tell maximum, me it's good now. Maximum takeoff weight, 15 tons, right? And it could carry up to 40 passengers. I don't see any other planes in 1958 that can carry upwards of 40 passengers. I'm not sure that's true, but Okay. <laughs> No, that actually no. To be fair, that I think there were probably planes that could carry more than forty just, passengers. Just wait till we see what other planes were at this air show made by other British aviation companies. Wasn't, say the Comet, was it? Oh yeah, there was a Comet. There. <laughs> <laughs> so hey, but look, you see the windows on this one? Round. <laughs> check we're ahead of the get check checkmate me. plane cocks. So British European Airways had literally a square, but you know, no fatigue issues there. So, so British European Airways had been in the room with the creators since they started pitching it to the government. Yeah, um, one of these are one of the, the, the airlines that merged into what is now BA. Um, they so they were flying a lot of stuff to Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. They were really interested in this like novel intercity air service meme. I guess. <laughs> and, and they were, as a crown corporation, like a fully nationalized airline, they were also somewhat invested with this idea of Britain being this, this innovative force that's still pioneering new sure. technology in the world. Um, spoiler alert, they'd also been so involved that they were assumed to be the Rotodyne's primary customer, ah. at least on the side of the Atlantic. And they were responsible for the initial 50 seat specification for their B line bus, B spelled B E A, like their acronym. They never actually committed to buying any. Mm. So this is what I like to call stochastic aircraft manufacturing, <laughs> where you're radicalized into building aircraft just by like subtle verbal hints. But what happened though at this air show is that people love this thing. So, so Kaman, which is like a company that made real helicopters in America, wanted to license them for production in the US. They wanted the, right, the, the wow. rights to the sales and services. Okay. They got them. Based on the performance characteristics. They just saw a big engorged explosion copter. Yeah. Uh, and were like, that's great. That well, we can do gotta it. have some of that. Well, their big customer was New York Airways, who owned one of the helicopters we saw on right, the helicopter okay. airline slides. Um, you saw their Chinook two slides ago, actually, which we'll get back to the Chinook in a second as well. So they signed jointly New York Airways with Kaman, saying, letter of intent, but we want a larger 54 to 65 seat rotodyne. With an option for 10 more. Wow, yeah. that'll really fill up the order book. But, but New York Airways was doing the thing of, we are flying helicopters from like Manhattan to Boston. Sure. But they were, the, the New York Airways was locked into this 25 cent per seat, cent per seat mile paradigm. And they wanted to half these operating costs with a larger rotodyne. That's way above even at the time what an aircraft would, yeah. normal aircraft would be. Definitely not more sort of maintenance and overhead on these bad boys than a normal helicopter, right? But don't worry, we'll never find out. Uh, <laughs> how, how does this compare yep. to contemporary passenger helicopters and airliners for capacity and range? Let's take a look at a selection of the other aircraft at that air show. Farnborough 1958. Only from Britain. So we have the Bristol Sycamore, which is a search and rescue in Kasavak helicopter with room for four. Oh, you don't have pictures of these? I'll flash them on the screen. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this, this is the Bristol Sycamore, yep. built for the same kinds of roles as this, well, Kasavak at least, uh, built 180 times more than the Rotodyne. Uh, the Westland <laughs> Widgeon, an improvement of the earlier Dragonfly license built American thing, private venture that despite it being a similarly sized helicopter than the Dragonfly, which is much smaller, Privately funded, no one bought it, still built 12 times more in the Rosedown. The De Havilland Comet 3, a further refinement of the world's first passenger airliner, 
that was powered by jets. Room for 58 to 76, so similar to the larger Rotodynes that NYA wanted in terms of capacity, despite the bloodlust these things had, <laughs> built 114 more times in the Rotodyne. And next we have the Bristol Pembroke, or the Hunting President, small civilian airliner, twin prop, room for up to 10 passengers, used for similar short-haul routes, despite having superior range, built 128 more times than Rotodyne. The de Havilland Heron, these are all aircraft being premiered at the same air show. The de Havilland, all from Britain! <laughs> The Havland Heron, because apparently we couldn't get enough of very small short haul twin props at the show, carries 14 passengers, better range, but 149 times more. Now, when you say like X times more, it's more than because... one. Yeah. <laughs> it's just how many times they were built, which is more times than any Rotodynes were built. The Saunders Row, Saro P531. And guess what, boys? It's another. Five seat helicopter, this time aimed at the Navy's fleet air arm. And what would you know it? There wasn't enough room in the market. No one bought it, built six times more than the ferry road to die. <laughs> Next, we have the Airspeed Ambassador, which I'm going to call the Norris Marina of mid century propeller airliners for absolutely no reason. <laughs> could carry up to 60 on medium haul routes, uh, built 23 times more than the road down, despite the fact there were so many terrible airliners we were making. There was no room in the market for this either. Bristol, 192 Belvedere, Britain's only tandem helicopter. We'll get to this one. We'll get to the Belvedere. Don't worry. As we will the Westland Wessex, what is it? this may surprise you, those were built a hell of a lot more than the road down as well. But the best, the best part of all of this was, of course, the Westland Westminster. Heavy transport helicopter. Mm was cancelled. Big, big thing. Big sucker coming out of British Polyarney. Cancelled in 1960 when Westland merged with Ferry so they could prioritise the Rotodyne, which it was built two times more than. Yeah. Okay, so this early interest, though. Apparently... All these executives from Caman and New York Airways and all these other companies had horse blinkers on mm. that Richard Ferry had slipped over their heads <laughs> so they couldn't see the 12 other aircraft at this place that could do the exact same thing. Well, not the exact same thing. The exact same thing. I mean, it couldn't look like this, though. For good reason. Right. I don't have any notes here. I just have random facts. Yeah. It set the world speed facts. record for compound aircraft in 59. Were, were there any others? None as big as that. We also have some glorious old, like, like British factories and steam trains in the background of this picture. I mm. love it. How is the wind go? Oh, one's a train. They're both trains. They're all trains? Never mind. Yeah. The rotors did not, if the tip jets did not light up for whatever reason, or you had an engine or turbo machinery issues, the Rotodyne could do run-on landings in auto-rotation. Mm. It could do multiple attempts at landing with no power. What? Yes. It carried that much momentum by being such a chonker, but yeah, it could auto it, rotate it well enough. Like, sort it could of come around. Right? It could come around and try landings again. They did this. Holy shit! Uh, it could take off and transit. Pretty impressive. It's pretty good. It could take off and transition in thirty seconds during test flights. If you were really giving her, yeah, if you were really giving her. Um, and then if the so they needed to compress or blow out valves to prevent issues in relight at higher altitudes by reducing air power. If you ever felt the need to go VTOL really high up. Huh. Yeah. All right. I also don't have much for this slide, but this is just them flexing the Rotodyne. That's a bridge. <laughs> That's. I think that might be the fairy medium girder bridge of Wikipedia <laughs> fame. Um, they, they, play, they paid tribute to the famous Take That. Uh, you know, album artwork at Battersea Power Station. Uh-huh. By landing at right. Bat yep. By landing at Battersea Heliport. To say, hey guys, look how quiet this is. Was it? I'm gonna say no. Mm. And a lot of military demonstrations as well. So these nurses were part of like a military demonstration of like, hey, for CASAVAC, for casualty evacuation and dealing with like battlefield victims, you could fit the slaps hood of Rotodyne. <laughs> you could fit so many nurses in this bad boy. They also flew into the Paris Air Show by flying these like London. Sounds to kind of ominous, actually. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just flew straight into fair, it. Honestly, yeah. given the history of the Paris Air Show, that's nowhere near the most threatening thing that's turned up at that. So 1960 was a big year for the road to die in a bad way. Ferry merges with Westland Aircraft because the British government starts holding guns to people's heads and going, merge, <laughs> you're not making any money. Why are you making so many different things that do the same thing? How many have you sold? Six? <laughs> well, <laughs> well, 12, well, I mean, six. Uh, and, and you? <laughs> None. 
These are always contentious times, but there is still a lot of enthusiasm for the Rotodyne. You'll have noticed in previous slides, the branding changed from the Farnborough slide, Fairy Rotodyne, to Westland Rotodyne. Right. Because they changed, the company changed, but they were still they were still keen on it. Yep. And there was still enthusiasm for making a larger Rotodyne. They were going to carry the Tyne engines from Rolls-Royce, up to 75 passengers. But these developments were too far down the road. It was taking too long to deliver them. Okanagan Helicopters... Oh, of Canada? Yeah. Would yeah. Be from British Columbia, I'd imagine. Yeah. Yeah, bud. Well, rather, no bud, because they cancelled their orders. <laughs> mm. And New York Airlines did as well. There's a lot of people who are passionate. Why? It wasn't coming fast enough. Ah. By 62, <laughs> Wesley needed more Dosh to complete the prototype and get yeah. it into production. Of the they, big one. Of the, no, just, just the normal, the Y. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. And they were saying, hey, look, British government will give you 12 for the RAF and we'll make six for British European Airways. Yep. Um, I've seen sources pointing both ways as to which of these customers pulled out first, but the funding from the British government was contingent on there being customers. Mm. There were now none. It seems reasonable. Yeah. So the military were the original customers with the war office and the Ministry of Supply being the ones who got that big checkbook in the first place. British European Airlines, they've been there since the start, signaled that it wasn't going to place any orders citing noise concerns. Hmm... Because you, to be clear, have made an exploding helicopter, like an explosion-powered helicopter. The explo- it's an external combustion External, engine. yes. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. explosion is on the outside. If the explosion is on the inside, the that's fine. The world's first rotating detonation engine. It really is. It probably didn't detonate. It was probably a deflagration in flame. The commonly held view on the Rotodyne is therefore that it was cancelled over being too loud. However, the pro-gyro cope is that it was cancelled for lack of government support. My argument is that if your aircraft is too loud, then you aren't going to get any support. I, yeah. I mean, mufflers? Would that have worked? Well, yeah. they were developing silencers. Yeah. And the same cope camp claim that these were working and bringing the noise from 113 decibels down to about 96, at 80, 180 meters away. 180 meters away. Still 96 decibels, which is the same as standing near a subway or construction site. Oh, at least. That's extremely loud. Still not great. Yeah. Okay. But that VTOL would only be used for the uh, part the of the flight. The bit where you're close to all the people on the ground. Yeah. That's, oh, oh, no, that's not good, is it? Yeah. That's the opposite of what you want, I think. So, so what ended up happening instead is the air infrastructure expands, already has been expanding massively into the 60s. It's kind of like when you build a really big runway. Yeah. Once the plane gets to the end of it, it's far from all the people already, so you can't hear it anymore. Absolutely. Yeah. And so Whereas then, these guys want to land inside Battersea Power Station. But what they also built was like motorways. Some places even built like a train to the airport. So ah. the intercity thing was like, what if you just Intermodal. Got, just get a taxi, then hop into like a Hawker Sidley Trident. The thing that BEA actually bought in 1962. Airplane. 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 Normal, sorry, to be clear, yes. A normal, normal, normal bloody yeah, airplane. I... So there's a, there's a lot of people saying these silencers were like, they were just almost ready. But they also don't talk about how finalized they were, because no one's really clear on that. Nor their like detrimental impact on thrust. There were other issues as well, like the, the vibration at the rear of the Rotodyne was deemed potentially unsuitable for passenger operations. <laughs> they never really got over that. It's it's unsurprising for such an immature aircraft gender to still be working out these like dynamics issues even after years of testing. But you, you know. gotta imagine being, hey, hey Bob, why don't we put a test pilot in the back just to see how it rides for what? Because in the put... cockpit, it's been real nice. No, but, just put uh... ten nurses back there and see uh, how yeah, shaken yeah, yeah. they are by the end of it. So the the fairies work in this field though did actually lead to like a lot of useful research proliferating about ground resonance effects in aircraft. Sure. In general, not yeah. just explosion copters. Good return on investment, I'm sure. So you can go to Western Supermare in southwest England to see the few surviving remnants of the Rotodyne. It's uh, it's just next to Shoe Zone. <laughs> According to the Helicopter Museum, the sole Rotodyne prototype was cut up at RAE oh, no. establishment, Farnborough, with Cranfield College snagging a fuselage section, which you can see there. Typical. A rotor pylon, which you can also see back there, and sections of the rotor that were donated to the museum in 81. They got the combustion can on the end. Yeah, they yeah. do. You know, it, it looks remarkably like the turbofan silencers that they were installing on retrofit kits in the 80s with the kind of scalloped uh, vibe to it. It gen- mm. genuinely looks very similar. Yeah. 
Oh, well, like, the museum just tried to collect as many Rotodyne relics as possible. They found, like, actual tip jets just spread over a field in Gloucestershire. Oh no, that's not where they belong. That's <laughs> where Rolls were using them for noise tests. And uh, they uh, they found a full rotor yeah. that had to be flown in by, uh, ironically... Helicopter. Specifically a Chinook. <laughs> I thought it would be interesting to, to just... What would have happened if the deep state hadn't killed our big husky boy? And compare it to what actually did make it into RAF service. I don't know what this is. This just came up in Google Images and I, I went with that. United in blood and the uh, Star Trek logo? Yeah. Ooh, with a gun instead of uh, like a pitot tube. I would, I would really not want to mess with the dynamics of this already very much vibrating <laughs> thing by firing live ammunition from it. So the Rotodyne wide a range of 724k, let's call that the combat range, and a, fifth, a 500k unit cost as quoted to airlines. 500k in that time is British pounds. I'm going to compare payload using troop slash nurse count. <laughs> let's not mess around with weights. So 40 troops worth for the Rotodyne. Let's ignore speed and ceiling. Those stats are for nerds. I will then flash up the following aircraft on the screen. The Royal Air Force ended up using the Bristol Type 192 Belvedere HC-1 in 1961. Helicopter. Britain's only indigenous tandem rotor. Got it. Um, it looks like an, if you can't see the screen right now, it's like an emaciated early Chinook. Mm. Uh, it had comparable range, but only 19 troops worth. Oh. And according to Wing Commander J.R. Dowling, who I've used in like sources for costing these things historically, they were only 390k per airframe. But they were then undercut by the Westland Wessex, a normal looking helicopter, mm. at 100, well, well, not quite, but better, at 185k per unit. Because mm -hmm. in 67, the RAF realized it needs to rationalize and optimize their casualty evacuation and heavy vertical lift fleet. So it's the late 60s. Obviously, they go straight to the Americans, get offered Chinooks, then realize it's the late 60s and go, you know what, we'll stick to the Westland Wessex. So they had a comparable range at 500 kilometers, only 60 nurse worth of payload capacity. Uh, so at a fraction of the cost, you could have two Wessexes for less than the cost of the Rotodyne, albeit with less than half the capacity and substantial range loss. By the late 70s, when somehow Britain discovered they had enough cash for this, they got the Chinook, but unfortunately for the Rotodyne, even comparing it to the early Chinook, it's like, it's contentious. So the early Chinook had a range of 1,344k, more. And upwards of 40 troops of troops worth of capacity. But looking at the earlier source on costs, they were looking at about 15 million for 15 or 24 aircraft. It's unclear. So you're in like a 625k to 1 million ballpark per unit cost in the 60s for these. Yeah. It's, it's competitive. That's a long way in a lot of people. I'm not sure I'd call that competitive. No. Yeah. Well. I mean, how many... I mean... If, if you can carry half the people, you means you're doing double the flights, half the lifespan, etc. But you do get to do it in a ferry rotodyne. Yeah, you do, yeah. and deafen all the people you're trying to evacuate. But I just, you know, I sure, oh, no, I, I hope we're over this whole idea of urban intercity air travel. Oh, wait, we're here. Yeah, we are here. There's more... Well, do we think, do we think the problem was the economic concept? I think the problem for these is still the noise, and then that has added problems from safety, crashworthiness. Oh yeah, I mean all these things you didn't have to worry so much about in the fifties and sixties are now very much a thing in the most built-up areas of human civilization. I do like when the uh, urban air travel promos include the New York skyline. Oh yeah, well they have to. You're gonna fly to the Hamptons, especially when they include one particular building. That replaces some other buildings that suffered from an urban air travel accident of some magnitude. <laughs> this just seems a bit on the nose. It, it's. I do think having no explosions at all going on, either in or outside of the vehicle under normal operating conditions, um, would be a benefit. I do know that battery technology is not at the point where you're going to be able to run any of these vehicles for any kind of appreciable range. But, you know, we're getting there. Maybe a tank full of hydrogen. Oh, wait, no, that didn't go well either, did it? Um, I mean, maybe. We already do helicopter travel point-to-point -point intercity. It is happening. There might be a space for these. I think some of them are intentionally designed to look as 
investor bait y as possible because if it just looked like an electric helicopter, no one would think it was cool. Yeah, it's almost like the designs are actually quite impractical when you think about them for two seconds. I mean, we'll see. Yeah, you know, we'll I see. don't think we will. So we're almost we're almost done. But I just there is something that we mentioned earlier that I'd like to pick up on. Next slide, please. We solved oh. intercity travel in 1964. They're so cool. This podcast has now ended the policy debate. We tried the spinning explodicopter. Yeah, it didn't work. Didn't work. We didn't really try electric interair urban mobility because it's not going to work we do have normal exploded copters but the explosions are inside and no one uses them except the police weather people traffic reporters and the ultra rich but what we also have is yeah. something that the the the, 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 the glorious nihon solved within three years of the rotodyne being cancelled if you have steel wheels running under wires with nuclear power, then you have perfect inter-urban air mobility solution. On the ground. You just have to, if your country happens to be full of really big mountains, you do have to make a lot of tunnels straight through them. And they did it. They did it anyway. And your country, Anyone can do it. dear listener, probably isn't full of big mountains. Because most of them aren't. Because, you know, it's hard to do that. And you won't have to make them earthquake-proof. No. In you many could, places, that's true. It's also true. You, you don't have to build... You could have hydropower. You could. You, you, you don't have to build a completely grade-separated network to run them on. Many places run them on conventional track for long stretches. It's still better than a ferry rotodyne. You might have to behave and get in lines and stuff so that the train can do one-minute turnarounds exactly at every station. Yeah, I'm okay with that because it yeah. doesn't involve riding an external combustion engine. Um, that's a trade-off I'm willing to make. Yeah, and hot meals. Hot meals. Yeah, fit way more nurses on these things. <laughs> you don't even have to palletize. You don't even have to palletize them. They get themselves on and off, no problem. Yeah, there we well, go. This is now a train podcast. I hope you enjoyed uh, obscure aerospace files because they're actually train files. So you now. wouldn't have found them under they the Dewey now. Decimal System they for really a fair are. plane. It's anyway, right? Yeah. yeah. I imagine we will come full circle on this and you will do the propeller or jet powered trains at some point. I've definitely not got those. In yep. A, in, okay. Yep. Stay tuned, folks. But yeah, that, that's actually, that's it. That's in conclusion, the Rotodyne was a gyroplane of contrasts. Unlike all those uh, very homogenous gyroplanes that had no contrasting features whatsoever. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for doing the audiovisual form of reading and joining us tonight. This is a passion project, so we don't have anything to plug or beg for. But if you like what we're doing here, somehow, then... He's doing an actual in outro. Figure intro, out. Outro, outro, all of it. It's written yeah. down. Yeah. This is where we just ramble, I thought. Well, it's, yeah, it's also 20 to 11 at night, so I thought we might... I'm the heel of this podcast. Does that make me John Cena? <laughs> if you want to be. I'm going to be John Cena. I'd describe him as a ham gorilla thanks fucking ripped ham subscribe on youtube if you want more ham gorilla um content content capital c content this is yeah okay but uh no uh if you like whatever the f whatever this was <laughs> you can subscribe on youtube and then you'll be updated the next time that i make fewer slides and decide to cut the length down substantially just like last time <laughs> In the episode, none of you will ever see. One day. One day, oh, maybe. the second channel. Maybe no. Yeah, maybe, cut. Maybe, In maybe, black and white. Maybe no. In black and white. In black and white. Damn. Half that episode wasn't black and white. It was some retro Soviet stuff. We'll do some more Soviet stuff. Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, wait. Also, uh, sources for this are in the description. No, he said bye. It's, it's over. Oh. Cut that out. <laughs>